all the way all the way into the early 18th century uh, that uh, climate changes and pandemics uh, uh, feed off each other in very very robust ways. Pandemics are uh, though not just driven by climate. That would be wrong and simplistic. It wouldn't tell us very much really about the present moment. The climate, pan uh, the climate pandemic nexus of the 14th century was really the product of feudalism's extraordinary commercial uh, dynamism, linking it up with the rest of Afro-Eurasia. This is not just a European story, but a uh, Eurasian story, an Afro-Eurasian story. And the arteries of commerce, the or arteries of migration flows were absolutely uh, central to the dynamic and rapid uh, spread of the Black Death. So the Black Death doesn't appear out of nowhere, and it doesn't appear just because of the climate. It appears because the whole apparatus of feudal civilization, its agroecology, its commercial networks, its productive dynamism, in all sorts of ways, we're already uh, showing the cracks, the, the cracks in the edifice. And when uh, one of these conditions, much less two in the case of climate change and pandemic come in, then you begin to see truly enormous and significant changes. So the end of feudalism was a climate crisis. It was a climate crisis that like so many of these crises, uh, was a moment of class conflict, of class war. Indeed, the reason why we get the great uh, uh, invasions of the New World, starting with Iberia, but linking up with capitalist and uh, imperial actors elsewhere on the continent, is because Europe's 1% had lost the class war in the 14th and 15th centuries. And so what we want to keep in mind is that this is not a geophysically driven crisis. This is not man in nature, but a geohistorical crisis in which social conflicts, economic contractions, agroecological problems are, um, are all uh, uh, part of a dynamic historical process with changing climate conditions. So this is an opportunity to rethink our man and nature model and to move towards a very different understanding of the past five centuries, and really uh, even farther, even well beyond that. Because one of the things that is easy to forget, and neither climate historians nor historical materialists have done a very good job in pointing this out, is that the famous Ruderman early anthropogenic uh, uh, thesis, which basically says that agricultural transformations stabilized the Holocene period, this, well, until recently anyway, this 11,700 year period of relative climate stability, that the carbon and methane uh, concentrations were essentially elevated uh, to prevent another either glaciation or glacial inception. Uh, that the Rudiman hypothesis about agriculture is not necessarily about man and nature. It is about the birth of class society. And class society is a carbonizing machine. And so we, we need to take that to heart as well as we look at the present crisis. The greater and more elaborated the class society, the more animated by an endless logic of capital accumulation it is, the greater uh, the carbonization of the atmosphere and the methanization of the atmosphere. So this is important to keep in mind as we try to make sense of the longer histories of the present moment, which are not, so they are in one sense in the past, but they're not over. They're very much still with us. And so the, the, the crisis, this climate crisis of European feudalism in the 14th and 15th century leads by a whole series of, of cascading events that center in Iberia, but are directly financed by Genoese capital. Think of the Genoese as the, uh, the great uh, bankers of the 15th and 16th centuries. Uh, a fateful alliance um, and a fateful relationship uh, uh, gets forged in that process, which is essentially to wed together financial capitalism, war making, and slaving. And so this is what happens in the invasion 
of the new world. The hegemonic view, uh, even for many on the left, is uh, something uh, akin to an immunological determinism. And that's a problem because, well, it's just not true. It is true that a significant uh, uh, section of the American Indian populations would have died regardless because their immune systems were compromised. But what was the real nail in the coffin? What took those figures from 30 or 35% in the 16th century to 95%? We're talking about 55 million bodies in the 16th century as a result of the capitalist Iberian invasions. What did that was this relentless uh, uh, interlocking, interpenetrating system of slaving, of war making, of financial capitalism. And this is something that Raj Patel and I hint at in our book, but uh, are really only able to scratch the surface. It wasn't simply like, oh, well, what an accident, all the Indians died. No, this was a genocidal moment at the birth of the uh, um, at the birth of capitalism and in the thick of the little ice age. And this was uh, what this did was to set the stage for the rise of capitalism, for the consolidation of capitalism in a way that would have been impossible uh, otherwise. Essentially what we see through the invasion and then after 1550, the immediate and aggressive construction of massive cash crop commodity producing enterprises, most famously the silver producing mines of the Andes and the sugar plantations of Brazil, but of course it's much bigger than that. Uh, what we see is the, the rapid and radical productivist transformation of the Americas, essentially putting all of nature to work on these two continents and then seizing upon the dynamics of sub-Saharan African formations to extract rising numbers of slaves. Now, here's the punchline that I'm going to circle back to in just a moment, that all of this matures in 150 years after 1550. This is what Emmanuel Ladari calls the long, cold 17th century. This was the worst of the Little Ice Age. And in order to understand how capitalism is working today, we have to understand that it was hardwired in this period where every significant major innovation that we associate with contemporary capitalism or post-1800 capitalism was actually in play in this era. Large-scale industry, large-scale mining, large-scale agriculture, coerced labor, massive proletarianization, uh, the racialization and gendering of labor on uh, an Atlantic scale, all of this was going on, all of this was maturing and crystallizing in this period that in fact sets the stage for the Industrial Revolution. So, so often we have looked at how capitalists and empires do terrible things to webs of life, that's true, but it, the whole system works because they are able to work in tandem to exploit and appropriate as much cheap work from women, nature, and colonies as possible. And that's what we see going on here. This is why the cartographic revolution was so important because literally you wanted to know where all the goodies were that could be put to work um, profitably, including human beings who could be turned into parts of nature. So often people will say, well, before 1800, we didn't really see very dramatic environmental changes. And that's absolutely not true. Uh, that if we want to find year zero of planetary crisis, it is very much 1492 and the audacious revolution in environment making that occurs in the centuries immediately after Columbus's initial invasion of the Americas. And this is, of course, not just a new world story. This is a story that stretches all the way to Southeast Asia, to the Baltic, to Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not just about landscapes. It's about uh, oceanscapes. And most importantly, in some ways, uh, uh, it's about human ecology and turning human beings from thinking uh, people with dignity worthy of respect into uh, elements of nature with an uppercase N, the better they could be treated cheaply. So here I just give you a little factoid that always uh, strikes me, that what you have is a quantum leap, really an order of magnitude leap in the scale, scope, and speed of environment making in this period of early modern 
capitalism. So now, as I said, there is this uh, ongoing process of genocide, which is directly the result of, of enslavement. And once en enslavement takes its um, toll after 1550, uh, the Spaniards and, and Portuguese move, but especially in Spanish America, they move to um, coercive systems of labor mobilization, which are not exactly slavery, but not very far from it. And then also there is the drawing of the world color line in a major way. But what does this do? What does the genocide in the Americas do? Well, as uh, Lewis and Maslin have been pointing out now for several years, this produces what they call the Orbis or global spike. That is the low point in carbon dioxide concentrations as a result of the New World genocides and forest grow back, uh, the, the retreat of agriculture and the carbon drawdown. This comes, this is a kind of perfect storm of capitalist climate crisis. Uh, because uh, Peru's um, um, Puente uh, Putina uh, um, uh, volcano erupts in 1601. Uh, we have also uh, the Mondor Minimum arrives a little bit later. This is a period of the absolute worst of the Little Ice Age. And as we'll see in a moment, this was a, a moment of profound crisis. Now, it is in uh, and, and uh, political possibility, political revolt across the world. So this is the era also in which our everyday folk concepts of man and nature or society and nature were formed. And while a lot of ink has been spilled around uh, their epistemology and their analytical effect, what I really want to emphasize is that the Little Ice Age um, intellectual history was intimately connected with the actual ru uh, ruling abstractions or the guiding abstractions of empires and capitalists in a line that goes from Vittoria, who's not very well known, uh, but a, the kind of master philosopher of Iberian imperialism, of Spanish imperialism, and then Descartes. And these are little Ice Age thinkers, Descartes especially. Descartes is writing right in the early, in the first half of the 17th century. He's writing in the Dutch Republic, which is also significant because the Dutch Republic thrives when everyone else, when everyone else's economy is in the tank in the Little Ice Age because it is so aggressively moving uh, to profit from the tropical frontiers of shipping, slaving, and sugar planting. So we're going to keep that in mind that this is part of a wider architecture, a wider geoculture of domination of these ruling abstractions. These everyday terms that we take for granted, society and nature, derive from the language of civility and savagery, which weren't just words, weren't just floating in the ether. They were the guiding principles of these empires and the apparatuses of capital accumulation that connected to them. So we want to think about this long history of geoculture, geopower, and geoeconomy, geoenvironmental transformation in the context of climate crisis. And now what's often dropped out of the frame, especially in climate history, especially in environmental history, is that this dynamic of converting uh, practically everything in the world that wasn't white, male, bourgeois, aristocratic, or imperial into uh, nature, into extended things, what's often missed from this is that this was absolutely fundamental to proletarianization and modern class formation in historical capitalism. So we want to get a sense of, of how that was unfolding at the very moment of climate crisis, at the very moment of the drawing of the world color line of globalizing patriarchy, and uh, also is nurturing a kind of geomanagerialism that would uh, only uh, really uh, take familiar form after World War II, but was not wholly absent before. And I've mentioned um, in other work how we can look at the British Empire in the 19th century with its botanical gardens, moving elements, I mean, most famously tea, but moving elements of uh, the web of life around to sustain its accumulation. This was going on in this earlier period as well. So remember, this is a moment of profound climate crisis. This is the Orbis spike, which is a result of the genocides, which come out of the slaving dynamic that was hardwired into this financialization, war-making, slaving trinity. 
and they were all self-reproducing because you couldn't wage war without the money, but you couldn't pay for war without selling the slaves. And that's essentially the dynamic that gets increasingly financialized, yes, yet again, in the Little Ice Age. So here we have, just to give you a sense of winter severity in this, in this period, and to give you a sense of the uh, profound level and, and geographical breadth of social unrest, political revolt all across the world. This is from Jeffrey uh, Parker's uh, magnificent work. And that the, the response to this, the reason why capitalism didn't crumble under climate conditions that were essentially identical to those of the 14th century when feudalism enters its terminal crisis and to the fifth century when Western Rome enters its uh, terminal crisis is because its, it's uh, interlocking dynamic of capital power and webs of life could essentially gravitate towards the tropics. This is a climate forcing, climate fixing dynamic. And this is also at the heart of why capitalism is a system of frontiers. Because without this, especially without the profits and the accumulation possibilities from the trinity of sugar, uh, uh, slaving, and uh, shipping, that um, it's very possible that a uh, world empire of some sort, a great agrarian empire, I think on the model of uh, um, Charlemagne would have replaced um, historical capitalism. Here, this is just a little uh, uh, sort of empirical uh, uh, sense to give you uh, uh, a, 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 a sense of the contrast between the massive drive to enslave human beings and put them to work in the Americas and the very modest levels of economic growth. I often say that the great mistake of uh, radicals is to see capitalism as an economic system. In fact, capitalism's economics only work well when you have really islands of commodity production and exchange and cash activity in oceans of um, cheap or potentially cheap nature. And you can see this again with the movements of the sugar plantation frontier all across uh, the Atlantic world in this period. This is so important to our period because we are living in an era of climate apartheid. We are living in an era of the world racialized, world color line that is also a class divide, a climate class divide in which agriculture uh, emerges as one of the main drivers as capitalist agriculture, the specific industrial monocultures, large scale, industrial production that is the heart of capitalist agriculture is, of course, at the heart of climate crisis. So one of the things that we're left with is uh, that the intellectual legacy of, well, of liberalism, but of also, also of environmentalism uh, has, uh, uh, is deeply rooted in the climate conditions of these eras. Now, again, it's not all about climate, and we shouldn't do that, but we should take care to understand that while climate is not everything, climate is in everything. It's in the ideas, it's in the culture, it's in the colonialism, it's in the class struggles, it's in the political economy. And so this is uh, part of what we want to reckon with when we look at Maltus and Maltus's enduring influence on environmental thinking today. And I don't just mean in the crude version, I mean in the version that takes questions of nature of any kind out of history is very much rooted in this moment of climate crisis and in the world revolution of the late 18th century. And indeed this um, birth of, of environmentalism in this period is not just related to, co to global colonial infrastructures as Richard Grove famously pointed out long ago, it's also, uh, and it's not just related to climate, the, the climate downturn after 1783 of the so-called Maunder Minimum. It's also a, uh, 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 the, the Malthusian response is also a response to the world revolution of this era in which England itself is essentially ungovernable in the 1790s and fears are quite widespread that uh, a more radical uh, alternative would be, uh, uh, would be found. Now, lo and behold, this exact same dynamic replays itself in 1968. So again, this is the confusion of man and nature or class, climate and civilization or class, 
uh, as civilization and, and webs of life as a dynamic and interpenetrating unity. But again, in 1968 with Ehrlich's population bomb and everything that follows from it, we have a response not to overpopulation in the world, whatever that might mean, but to the global semi-proletarian revolt, which was anti-colonial, which was proletarian, which was both at the same time as in the example of the Black Panthers. So why do we believe humanity is the cause of environmental problems? Well, part of it is that in our everyday lives, in our folk concepts, the ideas that we carry around with us, and then again, if as scholars, uh, the analytical concepts, they, they often overlap very closely, and they often are some version of humanity and environment. And what I want to suggest is that that's a mistake. And this is not because I'm a social constructionist. In fact, quite the opposite. My own thinking about this is rooted very strongly in the work of the geneticists Richard Lewinton and Richard Levins, who point out that the relation of species and environment is an active co-constitution is an active process in which species make environments, but environments are making the species, and environments are made up of all sorts of life as well. And what they point out is also true for human collectivities of every kind, that we are engaged in environment-making activities, and at least since about 5,000 years ago, some critical mass of humans, uh, and really the Archimedean lever of the carbonization of the atmosphere, has been class society. So we want to understand class society is not a thing that springs Athena-like fully formed out of, a sort of magically out of the head of Zeus as the web of life. We want to imagine class society as an emergent process of environment making that is both produced and producing uh, webs of life, not least climate changes. So, in order to make sense of this, we want to do something uncomfortable. We want to look at these sacred categories of society and nature, of capitalism and nature, of civilization and uh, environment, in, all, uh, in order to understand how the realities are much more porous, they're much more interpenetrated, and that the categories, that all of those categories that I just mentioned, are not just uh, categories of liberalism or the Enlightenment. Um, they all ultimately have their taproot in various Christianizing, civilizing, and since the end of World War II, developmentalist projects. So old wine, new bottles in each case. They are ruling abstractions. And so, uh, as I've often remarked, in an era where uh, the, the older languages of domination and oppression around gender and race and sexuality and many other areas have been done away with, or, or the critique of those is actively um, supported, there's still a discomfort in looking at how capitalism itself is both a producer and a product of the web of life simultaneously. So this is why I say, yes, there is an Anthropocene. It is a geological Anthropocene. And I agree with Maslin and Lewis that it is an Anthropocene that we can date in the 16th century. That is the geological moment of it. That's not a historical comment. They're not right. They're not interpreting and explaining a historical process. They are looking at what has happened in terms of the geological, geophysical transformations, which is necessary to history, but not uh, a historical explanation as such. So that means geological anthropocene, geohistorical capitalocene. That doesn't mean capital is seen as an economic system, although that's a part of it. It means a system of capital, power, and nature. And that means that we need to try to struggle to overcome our crisis of representation, which is one that has a very, very difficult time fusing a very familiar chart like this. We've all seen a million of these with uh, the representations of the crisis of uh, capital accumulation with the crisis of productivity. It's been very difficult to put together the geophysical moment of the climate, the climate change with the geohistorical moments of a long-term secular decline in the world rate of profit, with a long-term stagnation in labor productivity growth, 
which is really the beating heart of capitalist development. And, one of the, and the reason that uh, we've seen so much inequality is precisely because of the long-term stagnation of labor productivity growth, but also of the secular stagnation of industrial agricultural productivity growth, which, is, uh, which has already, in fact, since the 1980s, been suppressed by climate change and is now uh, um, facing even more severe crises. So we need to figure out how to put all of these together if we want to answer the big question of our times, which is, is this a developmental crisis? One that will be overcome much like capitalism over, and uh, capitalism was able to survive the crises of the 17th century and the 30 years war of this past century, of the 20th century. Is this a developmentalist crisis in which the conditions for renewed accumulation, especially cheap labor, cheap raw materials, cheap energy, and cheap food, where those conditions can be reset? And that's far from clear in a world in which productivity growth has entered into a secular stagnation. Or is it an epical crisis? Does it resemble the crisis of the Roman West in the fifth century or a feudal Europe in the uh, 14th and 15th centuries? So again, these moments of climate change are always part of this story. Climate's not everything, but it's in everything. And so uh, this is one of the ways we can begin to reorient ourselves is remember this, uh, uh, this line I had earlier that capitalism is about putting natures to work, including human natures to work for free or low cost. So what we have uh, today is really a threefold crisis in each major domain of the capitalist mobilization of work of the zone of paid work, that's a historical terrain of proletarianization and the semi-proletariat, the unpaid work of human natures, that's the historic work of uh, women, and the unpaid work of natures as a whole. And that has started to break down. So to conclude, we're in this moment of the pandemic. How, what do we make of the pandemic? I think, yes, it is very severe. Yes, it is likely to be protracted. I think what it tells us is even more interesting, that it is essentially a moment uh, that is unfixable within capitalism's business as usual. And we can see this uh, by the most advanced, uh, and that's not a compliment, by the way, the most advanced center of capitalist development uh, uh, in the United States, where the ruling class has basically completely abandoned uh, the, um, the, the drive to do anything meaningful about it, and instead taken the opportunity to redistribute wealth on an unthinkable scale, even more than during the Great Recession of 2008 to 2011. This will be, uh, uh, this is a, a full-blown attempt to simply abandon the case of social, the, 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 the challenge of social reproduction, and to engage in outright plunder and the redistribution, what I call Robin Hood in reverse, the redistribution of wealth from poor uh, to rich. But this is also spurring a moment of class revolt. This is a photo of uh, Amazon strikers from Europe, but also uh, there's plenty of that going on in the United States. Um, and, so, and so what we wanna look at is the pandemic in terms of its knock-on effects and it's amplifying effects to other contradictions rippling throughout the system, not least the climate contra contradiction. And the, the key term here is negative value, by which I mean dynamics that are essentially unfixable within business as usual, and therefore represent the possibility to negate or to nullify capitalism's law of value as it has operated over the past five centuries. It's the law of value, that is, it's sort of rules of reproducing wealth, power, and nature. And of course, we have this contradiction where, yes, CO2 emissions are falling, but CO2 concentrations will continue to rise. So as we enter into this period, we want to remember that this is a period of tremendous uh, unrest. It is a period of tremendous possibility, and uh, it is a moment in which we can indeed uh, interrogate the dynamics of capitalism and ask whether or not capitalism as it actually exists at, after five centuries is capable 
of resolving the climate pandemic and the widest range of other uh, crises in the present moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. That was a tour de force of historical thought, um, theory, and contemporary critical analysis. Thank you very much for that. And um, right, well, we, 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 we are running over the allotted time quite a lot, but people can just leave and, you know, we, we're recording this. So uh, if it's okay with everyone, we'll, we want to use the time here to uh, put a few questions to Jason. Jason, do you still have uh, a I'm few I'm fine moments? on time. I'm absolutely fine to take any, any and all questions. Oh, that's that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I think, you know, I, I, I've been thinking the questions in the chat. So please, please uh, stay unmuted and just put your questions into the chat. Otherwise, we'll, we'll really struggle with, uh, you know, with this process here. So use the chat function to put your questions and Costa uh, will will com compile the questions then then uh, read out uh, sort of some of them. We'll obviously not have time for, for all questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll give it a good shot. So I'll shut up and then hand over to, to Costa to ask the first question, please. Thank you very much, Stefan. Jason, thank you very much, a tour de force indeed. I've been compiling the questions and I just wonder if we can do it as a, as a kind of as a dialogue, as a, as a running, running conversation. And I'll start with, with, and I'll try and shape them in, in not in a chronological order, but in a, in a thematic as much as possible, doing this in real time. So could you please further elaborate on the, on the whole and the role of the state in the web of life, as well as within the crisis you are emphasizing and discussing? So it's, it's so important. The question of what kind of theory and what kind of history for what kind of state is, I think, one of the most vexing questions of historical social science. I'll be honest, I'm very dissatisfied with a lot of accounts of the state, most of which are very core centric. They're very much centered on the experience of, of France or Britain or the United States. And many of which, maybe most of which, tend to abstract the question of imperialism. So, uh, so in a question like that, I think, I think I'm always tempted to try to, to take on too much because we can't, there's, there's uh, you can't, possibly have a theory of everything that states do. Um, I think that, uh, and here I'm going to give a shout out to my friend Christian Parenti, whose book will be uh, on the American state, the environment making state will be out with Verso, I believe, at the end of this calendar year. And so I really want to recommend uh, that piece of work to deepen, uh, to deepen our thinking. The way that I've written about the state, which is uh, simply one, one key note of this, is to foreground the question of imperialism, and then to foreground the necessity of uh, states to forge effective anti-imperialist strategies. Now, the problem is that the states that have been most successful in pursuing an anti-imperialist strategy have been communists and therefore vilified on the grounds of anti-communism. Uh, which is ultimately rooted in this longer little ice age geoculture of civilization and savagery. And if you think that I'm making this up, you can go back and look at Voltaire and Rousseau as they are writing about Russia. They're saying exactly the same things about the Russians in the middle of the 18th century that the, uh, the Truman was saying about the, the communists and the Soviets in uh, um, the era after World War II, that Stalin, in Truman's words, was more like Genghis Khan than Karl Marx. And that has to, and of course, we can, we, so that long-term history of Orientalism comes in and really clouds our judgment. Um, the states are, the imperial states that have really shaped the modern world uh, have been, of course, outlined very effectively by people like Giovanni Arrighi, uh, that doesn't go far enough to showing how states and imperial states especially have pioneered ways of making webs of life legible, 
and have provided the military and security forces, especially around extraction, but not only. I mean, I, I come from the United States, which is all about militarized dispossession. I mean, forget about market differentiation. This was, uh, let's send the soldiers out into the countryside and kill as many indigenous peoples as possible. That was George Washington's legacy. So uh, it's, it's this heady brew of slaving, uh, primitive accumulation, both in the sense of class formation, but also, and this is always forgotten, in the sense of creating national debts. And what's forgotten is that uh, uh, Castile, the, the embryo of modern Spain, from the Reconquista in the 1480s onwards, is engaged in financializing its debt in order to wage war. And how does it wage war? It, it essentially goes out and enslaves people, and it promotes the cash crop uh, uh, production of uh, uh, cash crop, uh, the cash cropification of the world. And that doesn't fit so easily within historical materialism, which has done a terrible job coming to grips with the Colombian invasion and the genocides, and has done a terrible job in dealing with climate history. So, in order to make sense of the state. I think that we need to understand what are the conditions, not just of the class struggle, not just of the technical and capital composition of production, not just imperialism, but what are the webs of life in which those states are situated? So this would require taking uh, somebody's work who I greatly, greatly admire, James Scott's work on high modernism and the state and making nature's legible to the next level to understand that the states don't just become high modernist and engage in all these environmental transformations. They are themselves produced by a mix of class struggles, of environmental changes, of cultural shifts, of imperialism, and so on and so forth. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'll try now and, and combine a, a number of questions into, into this theme because we, you have placed the development of the state in a historical perspective and taken this historical lens and historical developmental lens. So let me see if I can if I can combine these and, and summarize them in, in one question. Um, so if we take this view and if we if we acknowledge the fact that there is a change, do you believe that first of all that this current crisis, whether it's a geohistorical crisis, is likely to also influence another paradigm shift, another shift of, of in the web of life from a new liberal capitalism to state capitalism? And if that is the case, can such a shift reverse? the climate crisis itself, and in any case, should we be thinking about um, th this kind of linear development, and should we include other perspectives and use terms and frameworks such as the Anthropocene, plantation scene, plasticine, etc., to better understand the complexity which is not between state and environment, but perhaps other actors as well. I don't know if that, that I'm happy to repeat any of that, I don't know if that made sense. Well, I think we have this vexed term of state capitalism, which has been used to describe everything from uh, uh, Portugal's monarchical capitalism in the 16th century to the Soviet Union to, uh, to even to neoliberal formations. And then, of course, uh, uh, China uh, would uh, uh, appear first and foremost in those kinds of discussions. But even in the United States, 37% of, of American GDP is accounted for by state spending. So this is, uh, the United States is not a free market society, but I think what I, what I hear from you is uh, uh, in what sense could we see a morphing of neoliberal capitalism into something that looks like capitalism in many respects, but is really held together by uh, a much more territorially directed logic of reproduction. And that I think is entirely possible. That I think we could live in a world 30 years from now that, that would be uh, maybe not quite a hellscape, but wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be great, that would resemble many features of capitalism, would have proletarians, would have markets, would have money, uh, would have consumers, all of these things, uh, but not necessarily be capitalist. In fact, it's very important to remember that proletarianization, widespread market exchange and commercialization, uh, financial activities, all of those were so important to pre-capitalist formations that we can rightly call them uh, constitutive of tributary modes of production. That is tributary in the sense that the political extraction of surplus was at the core of 
those civilizational experiences. That's more ta uh, taxonomical than anything. But I think we could see an effort uh, by, uh, uh, we could see an effort by, uh, you know, some parts of the world to really sort of make a shift towards a territorially driven logic of accumulation that would be significantly and epically different from capitalism and yet resemble key elements of the neoliberal project, especially in its militarization, widening social inequality, and, and uh, widespread environmental devastation. But it would still have to deal with the climate crisis and it's not sure, it's not clear that that's at all possible. Brilliant, thank you so much, Jason. Could I just then pick up on, on something you said and link it to the next question, please? So you, you, you've discussed the, the tributary forms of production and touched on territorially driven logic of accumulation. And we got the question here uh, regarding the nature of the crisis. So do we, do we have on the hand a developmental crisis or rather an epochal crisis of capitalism? And the clarification is, uh, do we, does the answer depend on the, on the combined abilities of alternative forces of reproduction to emerge and consolidate vis-a-vis -vis the capital and state? And if so, what is your take on the likelihood in our times for this emergence and possible consolidation of those tributary or alternative forms of, um, more, sorry, modes of production? Well, is a socialist transformation possible? Broadly conceived, a socialist transformation that is democratic and egalitarian and all those things that uh, we can feel good about saying. And I say it in that particular way because there's a tendency to ignore crucial elements of the history of the 20th century. One of those elements was the willingness of the imperialist powers to lay waste absolutely physically, socially, the, uh, uh, any, any opposition to uh, its power. So the, uh, the strategy of total war was really a capitalist response to communist insurgency. And we can argue about the pitfalls and problems of communist projects. Uh, I'm not here to say that those were fairy tales. But we have to understand that in the Soviet, Chinese, North Korean, Cuban, and Vietnamese cases, that these were uh, um, experiences that were either threatened imminently and directly by war, by total war, and by nuclear annihilation, or were actually subject to the most ferocious, ferocious episodes of mass murder in the, in the 20th century. That was the case of the German invasion of the Soviet Union in which 28 million people are killed on top of the imperialist uh, uh, invasions and wars of the long 1916 to 26 period in which 10 and a half million people die. The, the, for, for, many, for some people in the world, indigenous people understand this readily uh, because that's what happened to them and other, play, other people who have experienced horrific um, uh, 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 violence uh, understand the enormity of this. It's very difficult for many of us, including myself, to grasp that. So what was the protective mechanism to, uh, to deal with that? It was to build state power to effectively defend the gains of a revolution. Now, whether or not we, we want to, uh, uh, what we want to learn from those experiences is one of the most difficult, I think, painful and difficult analytical, intellectual, political things that, that we need to look at in the 20th century. But the other dynamic that we've seen, which is a kind of corollary, is the willingness of capitalist classes to allow so-called natural disasters to essentially devastate places and then just swoop in to uh, scavenge the bodies. This is Puerto Rico, this is Katrina and New Orleans, this is countless places in South Asia. Uh, so we, we, we have to deal with this long history, of, especially of imperialist powers to allow or actively participate in the mass killing of uh, many, many millions of people. I mean, think about the British in the 19th century with Ireland and India. Um, and uh, uh, or Indonesia under uh, uh, U.S. hegemony uh, with three million dead in 1965 to 68, or you know, not to mention the total wars of, of, of Korea and Vietnam. These were projects aimed at the absolute extermination of the enemies. Now, that's really dark, and I don't necessarily I don't have the blueprint for how to move forward. I'm here to say that those tendencies 
will reassert themselves, but they're not the Hobbesian tendency of a war of all against all. They're a, they're a, a kind of a Lenin tendency, if you will, or a Luxembourg tendency of the imperial powers uh, and, and sub-imperialist powers against the 99% or whatever metaphor we want. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Now, I know you said that that's that you don't have the blueprints, but you have touched on this dark side, this very apocalyptic terrain of the Hobbesian, you know, war of all against all. You've talked about the consolidation of state power to defend against this, this revolution and to, you've mentioned scavenging. And I, I have a range of questions which um, all fall onto the, the heading of how. Uh, and those, those go as, as follows. If we're heading towards this, such an ap ap apocalyptic um, solution and outcome, how do we deal with climate change effectively? In that sense, how do we limit unreasonable consumption? How do we make success of the Anthropocene? Uh, and given specifically bringing this to, to the, the COVID crisis and the, the cheap food production crisis in the UK, how can we restructure uh, current systems in the web of life, for example, the, the global food system, to ensure that uh, we don't reach this, this uh, uh, fiasco on a global scale? Well, the temptation is always to look for a magic bullet. You know, it's the state. No, it's uh, mutual aid and cooperation. No, it's uh, worker occupation of the factories and syndicalism. And the truth of the matter is we need all of that and so much more. Uh, for me, in thinking, I, I mean, I've always been one who's taken the core insights of, of Marxism and historical materialism around class formation and class struggle as often essentially correct but unduly narrow. So let me put it in, in those terms. That's a part of the struggle uh, uh, to, to engage in uh, a renewal of historical materialism in an era of climate crisis. And I've been very struck by uh, Marxists who want to defend the older verities as if the question of reproductive justice in the widest possible sense, not just social reproduction concerns, not just gender equality, but the reproductive justice of the planet as a whole and the way that that is irreducibly a question of the climate class divide, climate patriarchy, climate apartheid. There's been a real reluctance on the part of historical materialists to deal with that, as well as mainstream environmentalists. So how do we put these questions together? If our concern is social reproduction and reproductive justice broadly conceived, that has to be organized and coordinated at some level by something that we would call the state. So you ask about consumption. Well, consumption is uh, driven by this two-headed hydra of uh, transformations of the social division of labor. That's a classic Luxembourg argument. And then is driven by uh, the sales effort in the, in the great formulation of Baron and Sweezy. The amount of money spent on marketing and everything else has just exploded since the 1960s. Now, the problem is that environmentalists adopted, by and large, lock, stock, and barrel, the neoliberal sensibility that consumption is about individual consumer choices. They reinstalled consumer sovereignty and methodological individualism at the very moment when the advertising marketing apparatus had assumed not just larger proportions, but has become more invasive than ever. This is the, what everyone says about Facebook, et cetera. The product is you. So uh, there, this is, there's no magic bullet, let me say this, but if we are to deal with key, um, key dynamics of the climate crisis, the state will have to be present in reorganizing um, agricultural systems and rethinking agriculture from top to bottom, inside and out, and fostering peer-to-peer, uh, campesina-to-campesina uh, uh, networks. Uh, um, the state will have to be there and present. It will have to rebuild uh, uh, every city on the coastline on this planet more or less, rebuild the electrical grids, rebuild the cities so that they can sustain uh, low energy social reproduction, childcare, healthcare, education, uh, 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 all of that. That's not gonna happen by local cooperatives, but it can't happen without cooperatives. It can't happen without workers occupying the factories at the same uh, uh, time. So I don't wanna come here and say, here's this one magic bullet, but it is true that the left has been especially um, reluctant in over the past 30 years to deal with questions of state power. I think it has taken on board two uncritically anti-communist uh, ideology about what the state socialist projects did and did not do. And we need to go back and look at those experiences. 
Fantastic. Thank you so much. I think a final question, um, I think, is all we have time for. And again, I'll try and uh, combine a couple of questions and I'll go back to the comments uh, around the ever persistent role of the state that you envisage. And I think that you, you were discussing, Jason. So if um, the state is ever present uh, and will continue to be there uh, as an agent, who supervises, who checks the state, so who watches the watches to, uh, to ask to be, to be a bit facetious. Uh, and obviously that is the case if the state is there, but at the same time, there is no magic bullet. This is a wicked problem. There are multiple agents. What do we do right now to stem the progression and the descent, the spiral down into, into a crisis? Well, I don't know that we want to prevent this downward spiral into a crisis. I think what we're seeing is an audacious, many-sided movement to reclaim the commons as a livelihood strategy, as a reproductive justice strategy. This includes universal basic income demands. It includes, uh, in places like the United States, the uh, demand for health care uh, for all. It includes uh, the widest uh, uh, range of, of uh, worker actions and other, uh, uh, other politics to essentially decommodify uh, what has been enclosed, the global atmosphere of commons has been enclosed by capital as a gigantic waste frontier, and now it's, it's feeding back on us in a massive way. So there, in, over the short term, I think that we need to give up our fear of the collapse of capitalism, which is too often conflated with the collapse of all life. And we need to be aware that the word apocalypse from its Greek root means to lay bare, to reveal, um, and to stop being afraid of the catastrophes. Let's remember the 20th century, and indeed the past five centuries, have been an unending string of catastrophes for the vast majority of humankind on this planet. And so I think that that means looking at all manner of food justice, climate justice, reproductive justice, movements that are connective and synthetic in their vision. Instead of coming up with a sacred object, we need to come up with connective premises and the prioritization of that will be the outcome of politics. I don't think it's for intellectuals to say this or that has to be the priority because that is very much a conjunctural affair. But I'm always struck by uh, what Marx wrote uh, you know, to the German socialists in that famous, the critique of the Gotha program. And people are, eco-socialists are very familiar with one part of it, which is uh, uh, that Marx chides them for ignoring the, that soils and, and nature is just as much a source of wealth. But he also says something very important. He chides the German socialists for making labor a supernatural object. But that's what environmentalists have done too. What eco-socialism usually does is, uh, rather than synthesize the two moments, is to put them together and to add them up, to, to put two supernatural objects together. But also in that passage, which is often forgotten, Marx says, and he repeats this again and again and again, he says, labor is itself a natural force. And that's so important because historical materialism has really forgotten that. And it's forgotten uh, this famous passage. Uh, I bear, just bear with me as I sort of flag this last famous passage where he says in his introduction, uh, Marx and Engels say in their introduction to uh, uh, the German ideology, where they're outlining really historical materialism, modes of production, class society, they say all history must set out from the relations of humans to the rest of nature, their words, and they, they have to consider climatic and other geographical conditions. And they didn't mean we can list those at the beginning of our book or article and then go on to talk about the real stuff of class society. They meant that we need to carry those insights all the way in and through our stories of work and workers and exploitation and revolution and accumulation. And I think that that's, that's, that's what's so often forgotten today that we get, I think the fear of the catastrophe, which is a real fear, which is a reasonable fear, has led many radicals to kind of retreat into these sacred objects and to, to retreat into these verities. And some of the verities need to be kept, but we won't know if we sort of simply stand on our pedestal of 
class struggle or ecological Leninism or whatever it is, and then denounce every, every, all our comrades. We don't need that. We need a conversation in which we understand that no one has all of the answers, and we are all coming from these different vantage points, these different situated perspectives, to forge a dynamic account that, of capitalism, past and present, that can hopefully inform our struggles as we move forward. Uh, hopefully, the, the, the revolutionary transformation of capitalism and uh, a, a, a socialist transformation of planetary life. Great. Thank you, Jason. I think we need to leave it there. But thank you so much for, for this very, very uh, insightful uh, talk. It, it's, it seems the current crisis allows people to, uh, you know, to think more deeply about the crisis tendency of, of, of capitalism. And you know, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, to everyone, Jason has written uh, a number of really, really insightful books. Um, I can, I can <coughs> recommend them highly. Um, he doesn't just think fast as he just heard and talk fast, but he can write fast as well. So thank you, Jason. Uh, we, we, will, we will take some time to digest this. Uh, with your permission, uh, I'll email you about this. We'll, we'll make this recording available. Uh, of so course. People can think about this more deeply. Um, in terms of what is to be done, uh, let me let me finish on a technological uh, uh, note. Um, we, we need an open web, it seems. We need a, um, a web conferencing system that doesn't shut people out. So the reason <laughs> the reason we were so delayed with this because um, Microsoft shut us out, or in fact shut Jason out of its uh, system for too long. So we'll we'll, we'll have to radically democratize um, technology, it seems, particularly in, in the current uh, COVID-19 world, because that technology is the only way we are able to talk to each other. So- Democratize this, the internet commons, for sure. Absolutely, absolutely. And let me say thank you to Costas and Stefan, who have organized this and put, me, put up with me and uh, made this really a, a fantastic moment. We need more voices, more conversations so that we can, as you say, uh, uh, Stefan, extend this imagination to the internet commons, to everywhere. How do we reclaim the commons and do that in every area of life? Exactly, so let's leave it on, on that note. So thank you again, everyone, for your time, for your patience and um, uh, stay safe and uh, everyone, uh, good health to you. So we'll, 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 we'll talk soon, hopefully. Thank you, Jason, all the thank best. Thank you, very good, have a good day. And you. Thank you. Take care.